Okay. All right. So good morning, conservators. Welcome, welcome, welcome on behalf of Apostle Teresa Harvard Johnson, our fearless leader. I know she's probably like, why do they always do that to me? <laughs> because we love you. We love you. We love you. <laughs> our fearless leader in this of Conservatory Arts and Worship Center, Center family, we just say welcome. We thank you. And um, you know, we always say this, and it is not just a can statement, but we really want you to understand that we love you. We see you. We acknowledge you. And uh, we're grateful that you are here. So thank you for joining us this morning. We've already done our announcements and um, given information in the chat about um, giving and that type of thing. So all of that is set and done. So we are just going to jump right into the message. And I am asking, um, it doesn't matter who's teaching, this is always the request. And the sincerity of it is, is always at play. But um, today I'm asking you, I'm just going to outright ask you to posture yourself. Um, for what God is going to pour out. Listen, I might be teaching, but I even have an expectation because I'm like, Lord, I don't know which kind of way you're going to do this, how you're going to pour it out. But one of the, th in, in continuing our, um, in the vein of obedience, uh, one of the things that really has been resonating with me, and, and I just believe it's part of how God has wired me, is how bad religion has riddled I mean, riddled and ransacked our relationship with the Lord. And because of that, because of religion and how it has um, merged with the desires of our hearts that are not in agreement with God's, um, the church has not risen to the place that God has intended. And so this is a, a subject that is so near and dear to my heart. And so you all know me pretty much. I get passionate and, and, and I'm not yelling or screaming at you. I'm just, I'm just wanting us to understand that religion as a system has got to be eradicated from our lives so that we can truly become the full sons of God that he intended so that collectively we can show forth who he is in a greater way in the earth. So I, I, I just really wanted to put that, preface everything with, with that statement. So let me share my screen and we are going to get started. Uh, here we go. So I need to... Um, go into presentation mode and just if somebody can just give me a thumbs up that you can see the screen okay all right so today's topic and this is just part one um I'll, I'll be teaching again in a few weeks so today's topic is titled the standard so you see a couple of pictures there and i know some people are like what in the world does any of that have to do with the standard and we'll get into that but um just as uh, Prophet L.A. prayed, I pray that we all really posture ourselves to receive what the Lord is ha has to say to us today. So as with um, every lesson, message, or teaching that we present, um, we make sure to do our due diligence to put a copyright notification and disclaimer out front so that you know that God, we're, we're presenting what God has given us. Um, and the disclaimer is that I'm not any of these things, but I am using what God has given me in a very practical and spiritual way to present what I'm presenting today. And if there is information or um, items that are not mine that are in this presentation, please know that, they're, that uh, they were either public domain or they were purchased uh, by me. So a standard, most people don't know that a standard can sometimes be considered a flag. Now, I'll get into some other definitions of standard, but a standard from a military perspective is considered a flag or a banner. And so when we look at flags, there are no words, but there's symbolism there to help us understand what is represented in it. So we see countries, we see in the military, we'll see different units or brigades or regiments. I couldn't find any military ones that would allow me to use the pictures. So I'm using this, but I want, I just want to emphasize here that we understand from a, a 
a site um, perspective that a flag is something that we see and it helps us understand who or what is represented. So we see, of course, our American flag. We see other countries here. When we see it, we know what's going on. So I want you all to um, understand that flag and standard and banner, these things are used synonymously with a standard. And I know you're probably saying, well, what in the world does that have to do with um, obedience? So let's keep going. Um, a standard, when I think of it, and I'm sure that some of you, when you thought of it before I showed you the flags, um, the mindset is it's a rule of measure. It's, it's a point at which we're trying to get to. It's the precedent, it's the mark, it's the objective. It is what we're aiming for, it's the, it's the bigger vision. Um, it's the prototype and the pattern. Um, and it is what we are aiming for and what we are focusing on. So that is what I'm sure a lot of people thought about when they saw the word standard. But again, from a military perspective, and the, the Bible is very militant and it is a military manual. Um, I know people see it different, but that's my perspective. But when we when you study out what a standard is, and I took some of this information from uh, the Britannica Encyclopedia, it is an insignia of a sovereign state or community or organization or armed force, which I stated earlier, office or individual. And I love this. I love this. I love this. You know, we are children of God. So I hope that your your spirit is already making the connection. Um, a standard is, is um, something that was previously used in warfare, but it's now an insignia of leadership, identifying friend or foe, and as a rally point and signaling. I'm emphasizing certain things because I want you to, I, we're going to circle back to them. Uh, a standard was considered a rally point. It was used to indicate where the troops, where the people needed to gather, um, what the safe place was. And a standard also marked the place. And I want you to really listen to this. It marked the place where the monarch was actually present and stationary. And banners, which some standards and flags and banners are synonymous in some cases, but banners were mobile and they were typically used in battle. Now we know current day in as, as children of God, we are not warring like they did in the Old Testament. We are not submitting ourselves to ground level warfare, all of that. But the warfare that I'm considering as I look at this is the, the contention between how we are, who we are submitting our will to and what the internal contention is. Are we allowing ourselves to be shaped and molded by God? Are we being led by the spirit or are we being led by the law? So um, when, the, when the banner, when the standard is extended and lifted up, the question is, what does the standard in your life say? Now, as believers, the standard is very different than it is for other people. So I want you to just keep these things in mind as we proceed. So we always, as children of God, we always wanna make sure that we go back to the understanding that God intended about a word, a phrase, or anything. We don't wanna make up our own stuff and we don't wanna go with what, um, what has been established as the definition or understanding by other people. We really want to make sure that we stay in tune and align with what God says uh, a thing is to be, okay? So from the Hebrew understanding, which was God's original intent, the standard is also considered a banner. You can study this out for yourself. It is there in the word of God. It is a banner, it is a sign, it is a signal. Um, when you've seen people on, on boats, they might have um, the sail that is up that helps them directionally. And there's, all, there's most times you see a symbol or something on that sail. An ensign, which is another military word that just is synonymous with banner. Um, a, a standard is something that is lifted up. It is a rallying point. It is a distinguishing mark. 
And it is something that calls us into remembrance. The standard calls us to remember something. It is considered a warning. And listen, y'all, a standard is also considered a miracle. It is also considered proof. It is, it is, it substantiates truth. Hear what, hear, hear what the Lord is saying here. A standard substantiates what the truth is. It reinforces what the truth is. And it also means to agree and to consent. This is the heart of God in terms of what a standard is. So the question is, and we, this is stuff that we already know. I'm reiterating it for you. But what is the standard for the believer? We understand that the standard for us is love. Everything that God does is birthed out of love. He is love. So everything that is birthed out of him is love. So um, Song of Solomon chapter two, verse four. Now I wanna say, I gotta say this. A lot of people who have studied out Song of Solomon, they have made it everything but what it's supposed to be, okay? <laughs> I need to say that. But for the purposes of what we're talking about right now and, and to capture the love of God for us, this scripture was very important to share today because it is, it is our beginning point. It is our end point and it is everything in between. God is our precedence and he, he showed forth who he is through his son, Jesus Christ, and his banner, his standard over us is love. And it is interesting that God establishes this first because everything else in terms of the instructions, the commandments, the, um, you know, uh, the guidelines that he presents to us, they are all in there being specific. They are all birthed out of this place. So love is the standard. God is love. And, and we know God through Jesus Christ, his son. So that is our aim. Jesus Christ is our aim. He is the standard. He is the prototype. He is the pattern. He is everything that we are aiming for. The Bible tells us that I press. Paul says, I press towards the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. And, and it is only in Christ Jesus because God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son out of love so that we could be reconciled unto the Father. So you, we have got to make sure that we understand that our starting point, everything in between and our ending, the standard across the board for us is love. That is why we obey. That is what woos us to allow our will to be laid down for whatever God wants. Not out of, as it's been said in other, teachings, not out of blind obedience or just to check a box or just to say that we've done something or, or being rebellious, even though our physical outward act is in agreement, the heart is in an agreement. We have got to make sure that it, that we are obeying out of love because that is our standard. Amen. So, and I just put this here. Um, let me see. I'm sorry. Let me go back. So I put this here because, again, to demonstrate that Jesus is our standard. And a lot of times we stop at the cross. Jesus is the fullness of God. And if we stop at the cross, we are not allowing ourselves to be pulled into the fullness of his love. So I have here the cross and the, the, the tomb that shows that Jesus was resurrected. So there is a fullness that we have to enter into so that we can truly obey authentically and from a pure place. Um, and that being from love. So we don't want to just stop at the cross in terms of, oh, God loved us. So Jesus died on the cross. No, oh, God loved us. He died on the, he sent Jesus to die on the cross. <clears throat> And Jesus didn't stop there. He got up out of the grave with all power in his hand so that again, we could be reconciled unto the father. That's love. That's our standard. That is what we are pressing from, pressing to, and pressing in. Can I get my slides together? 
Okay. So now that now that I've set that as as our understanding of what our standard is, our standard is Christ Jesus, who is love, who represents the Father. Um, I want to go back here so that we can see more fully and better understand what this looks like. So Jesus being our mark, the place that we are pressing towards, when the when we look at the meaning of the standard, some of these things should start jumping out even more. They should be, they should start being illuminated even more for us. Jesus is the sign. He is the one who was spoken of in the Old Testament. He was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. The, the prophets of old, the, 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 the people of the Old Testament, even Moses and everything he did and how, you know, nowadays we're elevating men over, over Christ and the law of Moses over God. No, what he did is show forth symbolism and things that would indicate who was to come who is Christ Jesus. And Jesus, his advent, his coming, his doing everything he did was, was he, it, it represents the sign that God is present with us, that he is here. He is the rally point. He is the distinguishing mark between what people have established as, um, as the attainment of some place of perfection or as the attainment of something good or we've met all the qualifications. Jesus is the mark. He is the only thing that can, he is the only person who can bring us into the place of perfection. He is the signal. He is what, well, he is the one who was lifted up. The Bible tells us if, 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 if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. In other words, if I am your standard, if I be the standard, if I be the one who you rally to, who you come, you, 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 you gather in the name of, from the heart, not out of obligation, but out of a, a heart to really be connected with God. He, Jesus Christ is the rally point. He is the one we look to to remember the love of God and the sacrifice that was made for us. And all of that should pull us into a desire. It should begin to deal with our desire that has been cultivated in religion and out of our own wantings and things like that and help us to relinquish that, to exchange that for what God wants. And my goodness, was not what God did through Jesus Christ miraculous? Was it not proof that God loved us? Was it not um, just a, a earth shattering to be honest with you that it, well, when you think about, when we sit and we really ponder about what Jesus did for us, he made a conscious decision. If we go back to the Garden of Gethsemane and we look at, and I mean, intricately look at the struggle the struggle that was present when he asked the father, please let this cup pass for me. He had a moment where it was so weighty and it was so much that I, I'm willing to say he just, he, he, he felt like it was too much. But then he looked at us, the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He saw what he had to endure, but he saw us on the other side. And so the miracle of God, of Jesus Christ saying yes to the father's plan allowed us to have the, 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 the opportunity to be reconciled to the father. Jesus Christ is proof. He is the standard. And when we aspire to Jesus Christ, when we press towards the mark, we are indeed saying that we come into agreement, that we consent with, that we say yes to, that we allow God's plan to unfold, not with rebellion in our hearts, not with all of the contention in our our minds, but we fall back to the standard and we say, yes, God, because we understand that everything you've asked of me, what you're presently asking of me is because you love me. And because you can see the whole picture, it is better that I say yes from the heart that I lay down what I want and I exchange it for what you want. Amen. So I hope we got that. So 
now I want I, I really want us to 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 look at what has I want to make some distinctions here because a lot of people, a lot of believers, and we're all guilty of this because I I, I believe to the day um the Lord takes us out of here, we are going, He's going to be perfecting us. And all of us have some type of religious res, um, residue. Can we be honest about it? All of us have some type of religious residue that has to be dealt with that helps us move closer and closer into the fullness of obedience and in deep into deeper relationship with the Lord. So we need to examine ourselves and we need to make a distinction between the standard that religion has set, which is, is very um it's very close to what we have set in our in our own desires and our own mind and in our souls and then making the distinction between Christ Jesus being our standard so we want to look at that and i y'all know we we got to I, I love self assessment because it keeps us from pointing our fingers at other people and getting us right getting us right because if we at the individual level are not doing the work to get us right the community suffers and we know from the beginning that god has always been about community so that's part that's another reason why we need to really examine why uh, what the importance of pure obedience is so um before i go here Religion, I want to say this is not I'm not talking about the good of the the religion that we're we, we're Christians. OK, I, I sometimes I don't like to use that word because it's been so convoluted and, and jacked up. But Christianity is a religion. OK, there are some things that we do in in the context of the religion of Christianity that are good. So I'm not even addressing any of that. It's good, it's not causing us to be separated from Christ. It's not causing any hurt, harm, and danger. It's not doing any of those things. So I'm not talking about that one. I talk about religion or religious or the religious mind. What I'm talking about is this, this, um, this, oh Lord, what is the word I wanna use? This infatuation, this connection to rules and regulations this this need this appetite this appetite this unprecedented appetite to gauge obedience engage relationship by checking boxes by saying i did this or i did that or i did that so i qualify using these these, these rules and these guidelines to dictate whether or not we are in, in right standing with god that's what i'm talking about we got to be done with that kind of stuff so that's what that's what we're looking at the distinction between what religion has deemed as good and right and ob you know obedience and and causing us to be in right standing with God and what Jesus Christ came to help us understand is really uh what God's heart is so you guys have seen this filter before and I've repurposed it and we are using it again because I want you to see um just a visual of what God is intending for us now religion and our own twisted desires is represented on the left side. And all of those things collectively, collectively they yield bondage. It, it, it brings forth darkness and darkness is not just evil and demonic and, and wickedness and things that we typically move to. And again, sometimes religion is the, is the culprit to make us think that. Darkness is also ignorance being veiled having no understanding right and 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 so and then religion i just talked about that the law and and, and needing to check boxes and do external things to feel like we're in right standing with god and 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 and, and we see the last one is law so all of those things that they're, they're they are contamination that it's contamination it's, it's it's dirty it's it's not pure and most of the time we see obedience coming out of this place. I am obeying because I'm in bondage, I have to. I am obeying because I don't understand how much God loves me. And so I'm just gonna do what I, what, what, who, what's been required of me by what the denomination says 
or what the church house says or what the person next to me says because I believe they are further along in God than me and they know better than me. Um, what religion has said, what the law has said, what the Ten Commandments are, what other laws that, that are out there that, that have been erected by people that have nothing to do. There is no agreement with the heart of God in the law, this, this use of the law. But what, what we need to understand is that Christ is our filter. He is our standard. And when we operate out of him from truth, from the vine, from the way, from the door, we are able to produce and live in and thrive in a place of freedom in the place of light, in the place of relationship, and in the place of life. We are not bound by what somebody else deems is right relationship with God. We are not bound by what um, somebody's limited understanding has previously pressed into us. And so now we are, we are, um, regurgitating the same thing. We're regurgitating darkness. We're reproducing darkness. Um, no, when we are filtered, when we are filtering what is being asked of us through Christ, we can, we can begin to see what's pure and what's not. We can begin to build right and pure relationship and we will walk into life. The Bible tells us that he came that we would have, um, life and life more abundantly. People have life, they're living, they're, they're, they're existing, but they, are, they have not moved into the place of the life that God intended from the beginning. So keep this in mind. And here we got, we got a lot of things that's helping us see just how deeply rooted um, religion is in our own desires. And everybody that's on the line that subscribed, you, you should be very familiar with Matthew chapter 23. All of the scribal strongholds, you know, your whitewashed tombs, your hypocrites, your, your serpents, your, you are following rules, but your heart is far from God. You are doing all of these things and you have no connection to God. Are we, are we examining ourselves to see where we are doing this rituals, routines, we're wearing stuff, we're saying stuff, all of these cliches, all of these, these things we feel we need to do. We need to fast for 30 days. We need to, we need to put this down and we need to do that. And we need to, all of this stuff, all of this onslaught of things. And the question is, how did it move us closer to God? How did it move the needle? How did it press us into deeper relationship? That is the question. Keeping standards, keeping rules and regulations that have nothing to do with the Lord. Let's go to the word of God, Galatians 3, verses um, 24 through 26. And I'm trying to keep time because um, I know that I'm not going to get done with this today. <laughs> Part two is going to have to catch some more stuff, but um, let's, if you have your Bibles, perfectly you do, let's go to Galatians um, chapter three, Galatians three, verse 24 through 26. And the word of God reads, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. The word is so good, y'all. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Let me read that again. I, 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 the word has to resonate with us. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we no longer, we are no longer under the schoolmaster for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The law was a type and shadow. It was set for us, was nothing wrong with it during the time which God wanted it to be used. But now 
that Christ has come, it is no longer necessary because Christ in his fullness has brought us into the very intent of God. There is no longer a need to check a box. There is no longer a need to follow like Lord, forgive me for using this word, but you all know I'm not saying that you are or I am. I'm just saying it is a characteristic of sheep that just, just blindly, just being foolish, running after things that sound godly, running after things that feel godly on account of what has been established and birthed out of the law. But when Jesus Christ came, the compulsion is now, I am the fullness. This is Christ. I am the fullness of God. I have come. I have fulfilled all of those types and shadows. There's no need to be pulled into the former because what, what the father intended is now here, is now present. So I don't have to keep in step with this other stuff. All I have to do is remain in agreement with the standard who is Christ Jesus. Are we understanding that? Are we understanding that? Second Corinthians uh, chapter three, verse 10. Um, and it reads, for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, but by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away with, okay, wait a minute, I'm reading the wrong one. Three and six first, let me read six first. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament? Listen, we have been made able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. What the, why are we so tied to something that is meant to kill us? What is the what is the appetite? What is the, the 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 hunger for something that is meant to destroy you and me? Where what what is the deal with that? Why are we like a a, a, a moth that is 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 just attracted to a flame that is supposed to com just completely take us out of here? This is what this is saying. We haven't been called to death. We've been called to life. The Bible tells us Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So if that, if that is true, which it is, and he is the standard who he is, why are we not pressing towards him, but we're pressing towards death? I, I really need us to ask ourselves these questions. Why are we subjecting ourselves to death? Why are we pulled to obey things that cause us to die instead of to live? We, are, we have been made able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, the law, but of the spirit for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. My goodness. The Bible goes on to say down through seven, uh, seven through 16, but I want to read um verse 11 specifically for if that which is done away it's clear y'all the bible tells us that the law is done it is done away with it's been eradicated it's, jesus christ has fulfilled all so the law is gone now it had its glory during its time, but now that Christ has come, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Christ, our standard, is the, is the reason we should want to obey. He is the reason and he is the, he, he is the pull, he is the compulsion to come into deeper relationship with the Lord. He is the reason we should want to make the exchange and say, my God, this is what I have lived by my whole life. This is what I have, I have, I have submitted to. This is how I have proceeded from all these years. And you have come, you have made a sacrifice, the greatest sacrifice that anyone can make. The Bible tells us how, how great a love is this, that he would lay down his life for a friend. You have done that for us, Lord. 
You have done that for us. And we are still, we are still looking to what was old, what is stale, and what can give us nothing but death. My goodness, Lord have mercy. I hope y'all are understanding the word of God. Now, we're going to get into Colossians chapter 2, and we'll probably have to end there, um, but we're going to have a part two, so don't worry about it. But listen, please break out your Bibles because this chapter is phenomenal. Listen, it's phenomenal. I, I, you know, sometimes you can read the word of God and it's like, oh, that's good. That, 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 that did, that did me good. But then there's some things that the Lord will point you to that will make you run like you're running from somebody that'll make you holler, that'll make you write for days, that'll make you start creating, that'll make you just want to just give up anything that is causing you to be separated from him. My God, Colossians chapter two. Oh my goodness, if y'all have not gotten into it, get into it. But before I read that, I, I just want to read this and I pray that it's all right, but I, I, I got to be honest. I, I'm mean, not honest, but I, I think this is this is really going to emphasize and give a, a, a visual, a mental picture of what all of this on the screen has done. Now, I don't want anybody to be triggered. Please stay in the spirit because this is th this is really a vivid picture of what is happening by the spirit when we are pressed into doing and being based off of religion, off of the law. So here we go. I'm going to read it quickly. Her legs shook uncontrollably and her frail hands scratched at the imaginary bugs crawling underneath her skin. She desperately wanted the involuntary movements in her body to stop, but seems her limbs had a mind of their own. She nervously waited for the person she was supposed to meet. He was taking too long. She needed her stuff and she needed it now. When he arrived, he provided her treasure and she provided his payment. With treasure in hand, she took off running from the rendezvous point in the direction of her house. She was so adamant about getting to her des destination, onlookers assumed she was running from the police. She tripped up the porch steps in her haste to get inside. When the front door closed behind her, she locked it and she slid down to the floor. The coveted package in her sweaty palm sweetly called out her name. She knew this relationship was bad for her, but she was always satisfied when they were together. She made her way to the room and yanked out the nightstand drawer. She grabbed her tools and went to work. Although her leg was shaking and her skin was crawling earlier, she was abnormally composed in this moment. She was meticulously, she meticulously drew back the bottom of the syringe and pulled in the bubbling portion from the hot spoon. She placed her forearm on the nightstand and focused on the bruised bend in her arm that exposed her overused veins. The all too familiar needle pinch was an immaterial part of her experience that quickly dulled in the light of the pending euphoria. Boom consummation. The two had become one. As the solution entered her bloodstream, she removed the band from her arm. Her head fell back and nodded, and the needle dropped to the floor. The room, the room grew awkwardly still, and for the moment, she felt better. At every turn, people are searching for their next fix because they are addicted to the system of religion. Listen, I don't, I don't even know, Lord, if I'm going to get past this slide. This is a picture of what is happening in terms of the dependence, the, 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 the draw, the, the, just the connection to religion and how deep it has gotten. It is so it is so controlling at this point that some people don't even know how to live without it. Some people are fiends. They're 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 addicted, and they don't know how to how to how to break free. They don't know how to break free from this yearning on the inside of them that was established by death. Mm, I hope y'all hearing what I'm saying. How many 
And again, we all have been in that predicament. Don't got, got to get up Sunday morning, got to get up Wednesday, got to go to all these events, got to put on certain clothes, got to say certain things, got to go certain places, got to be subject to certain people, got to take what they say is true, got to do all these things, got to fast, got to, 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 going crazy, knowing that it's killing you, but you're still, still still being pulled and controlled and moved and molded and shaped our religion. The very things that Jesus came to destroy so we could have a right relationship with him, that we could have abundant life, that we could come into the fullness. He is the fullness. And if we are in Christ, then we should be full as well. Not of anything, not of anything that has nothing to do with him. All of this, remember the law of Moses. Oh, I remember the law of Moses when I look at Christ Jesus because he is the fullness. He is the perfect law of liberty. Oh my God, do we understand the gravity of what is happening in our lives and in the, in the body of Christ. And we gotta deal with this because if we don't deal with this, we cannot obey like we need to. We will not see things turn around in our homes. And first in us, we will not see things turn around in our homes and our neighborhoods. We will not see things turn around in the church and in the world. What has been the standard for you? What has been the standard? We gotta make a distinction, y'all. We got to stop putting all this emphasis on what we're doing externally, and we need to begin to look at what is happening internally. What does God require? As Prophet L.A. talked about a couple of weeks ago, what is God's righteous guidelines? What are his righteous guidelines? What is moving us closer to him? So let's read um, some of Colossians 2, and I'm going to move out of the way. My gosh. Mm, 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 mm. Lord, have mercy. Help me, Jesus. Colossians chapter two. I'm just going to start reading and we're just going to be led by the Lord. For I want you to know how great is my solitude for you, how severe an inward struggle I'm engaged in for you and for those believers at Laodicea and for all who like yourselves have never seen my face and known me personally. For my concern is that your hearts might be braced, comforted, cheered, and encouraged as they are knit together in love. Come on, the standard. That they might come to have all the abounding wealth and blessings of a sure conviction of understanding. Oh my goodness, let me read that again. That they might come to have the abounding wealth and blessings of a sure conviction of understanding and that they might become progressively more intimately acquainted with and may know more definitely and accurately and thoroughly the secret of God, which is Christ, the anointed one. In him, all the treasures of divine wisdom, comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God, and all the riches of spiritual knowledge and enlightenment are stored up and hidden in him. My goodness, the word of God is so good. Do we see that Christ has all of what we need? <laughs> in him, all the treasures of divine wisdom are hidden and stored up. I say this in order that no one might mislead you. Listen to the word of God, that no one may mislead and delude you by plausible and persuasive and attractive arguments and beguiling speech. Oh, religion gonna make it look good. Religion gonna make it feel good. Religion is going to draw you in if you are not standing in Christ. For though I am away from you in body, yet I am with you in spirit, delighted at the sight of your standing shoulder to shoulder in such orderly array in the firmness and the solid front and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Come on and tell them, Paul. <laughs> tell them. Leaning of the entire human personality on him 
in absolute trust and confidence in his power and wisdom and goodness. The word is, 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 is helping us understand why we need to maintain Christ Jesus as our standard, leaning our entire personality, our person on him. As you have therefore received Christ, walk in union and conformity to him. Have your roots firmly and deeply planted in him. I go, uh, I'm going on down. Verse eight, see to it that no one carries you off as spoil or makes you yourselves captive by his so-called philosophy, intellectualism, and vain deceits, idle fancies, and plain nonsense, following human tradition, human tradition, men's ideas of the material rather than the spiritual world going on. For in him who is Christ, the whole fullness of the Godhead continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of divine nature. Everything we need is in Christ. He's in us. And when we obey out of a pure place, when we eradicate all this stuff you see on the screen, that's when the fullness of Christ can be seen in the earth realm. There's a whole lot of stuff here, but let's go down to verse 18. It says, uh, verse 16, therefore let no one sit in judgment on you in matters of food and drink or with regard to feast day or new moon or Sabbath. How many times have we seen this? Such things are only the shadow of things that are to come and they have only a symbolic value, but the reality the substance, the solid fact of what is foreshadowed, the body of it belongs to Christ. Let no one defraud you by acting as an umpire and declaring you unworthy and disqualifying you for the prize, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels and taking his stand on visions and claims he has seen, vainly puffed up by his sensuous notions and inflated by his unspiritual thoughts and fleshly conceit and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body supplied and knit together by means of his joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God, from God, from God. If you then have died with Christ to material ways of looking at things and have escaped from the world's crude and elemental notions and teachings on externalism, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to rules and regulations such as do not handle this, do not taste that, don't even touch them, referring to things all of which perish with being used external? To do this is to follow human precepts and doctrines. Listen to the conclusion of this chapter. Such practices have indeed the outward appearance that popularly passes for wisdom in promoting self-imposed rigor of devotion and delight in self-humiliation and severity of discipline of the body, but they are of no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh. Come on, somebody with the word of God. They are of no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh, the lower nature. Instead, they do not honor God, but they serve only to indulge the flesh. Oh my God, Colossians chapter two. It is, it, I've given you scripture to show you why we need to ensure that Christ is our standard and not religion and not our own uh, our own ideologies because it is going to lead us into death and it is only going to indulge the flesh and, and, and um, compel it to keep doing what it wants to do, compel it to keep going after what it wants. And there's never any training. There's never any development. There's never any push into maturity to align with and agree with God's heart on the matter. I pray that we are hearing the word of God. And I just went through Colossians. I didn't even remember I had the slide, but we already talked about this. But the emphasis I really want you to look at is verse 17. Such things are the are only the shadow of things that are to come. A shadow of those things. They're all, they're all they have is symbolic value. But the reality, 
the reality, the substance, the solid fact of what is foreshadowed, uh, the whole body of it belongs to Christ. He is always pointing back to Christ. I hope y'all see, see the pattern here. This, this is what the standard is all about. This is where we obey from, the, the purity of relationship. So I'm not going to read all these scriptures. I put them there for you to, to study out yourself. But what the ones that I do want us to really read and, and emphasize here is Exodus 33 and 13 and um, Philippians 3, 10 through 11. So we all know what Exodus 33, God told him to go deal with Pharaoh, uh, let my people go. And he said, now, therefore, I pray you, if you have found favor in your sight, if, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways so that I might know you becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with you, recognizing and understanding your ways more clearly and that I might find grace and favor in your sight. And then he goes on to ask the Lord to consider the people. There's something profound about this because Moses said, let me know your ways so that I can know you. He didn't, he didn't stop at just let me know your way because your ways demonstrate your character. But he, his ultimate request was, I want to know you, Lord. I don't want to know all of the peripheral. I don't, I don't want to know all this extra stuff that people will try to put in the equation if I can just know you. That's what my desire is. I want to know you intimately, more deeply, so that I can understand who you are. Because if I understand who you are, obedience is not even an issue at this point. Because I'll, I'll be so connected to what you want, I will move in that direction. The obedience will come by default. And then Philippians, um, what do what I have here? Three and 10. And this, so that I might know him experientially, becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely. And in that same way, experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is as active in believers, and that I might share the fellowship of his sufferings by being, listen to this, com continually conformed inwardly into his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did, so that I might attain to the resurrection that will raise me from the dead. All of that to say, this is familiar. You all know this. I'm just reminding you. Paul said, I, I don't, I don't want to know nothing but Christ. I just want to know you, Lord. I want to know every aspect of you. I want to know your sufferings. I want to know your triumphs. I want to know your power. I want to know everything about you. I want to be intimately, experientially, progressively acquainted with who you are. Basically, he's saying, I want to grow in relationship. I want to be so deeply connected to you that, that, that I understand what you want. And I will go with what you want willingly. It won't be blindly. It won't be because I'm obligated to. It's because I want to follow you. Because I know that, that you have everything I need and I just want to go and move in that direction. That is my declaration and prayer for us today. Can we desire God like that? Can we so want to? to be in relationship with him, that nothing else matters. Y'all know when you get into a place of true worship and true communication with God, it is so pure and it is so weighty that you can't even think about what else is going on. Your mind doesn't even fathom the, the problems and the trouble and the struggle and the war, the, the, the waves as Peter, when he got out of the boat, there is no consideration for what is happening round about you because you are so singularly focused on Christ that anything else doesn't even come into your purview. Mm, 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 mm. Do the, the, the declaration, oh my God, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm not even done with this, but Father, I'm just stopping right here. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that 
everything that was said today that need to resonate with your people, Lord God, is resonating. Father, I thank you, Lord, that, that you are using your word to eradicate all of the residue of religion and, and the soulish intentions, Lord God, to, to gauge obedience, Father. I thank you that you are tearing away anything, Lord God, that would separate your people from who you are. Not your hand, God, but you. Oh, my Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that there is an exchange of appetite. That there is an exchange, God. Oh, my goodness, that there is an exchange for what we want, for what you want, oh, God. I thank you, oh God, that you are digging into the recesses and the hidden places of the heart even now. I thank you, oh God, that you are exposing to us, Lord God, where there are creeping little things and intricacies and nuances, Lord God, that are still controlling us, that are still prompting us to follow religion, to follow the soul and, and all of these sensual desires. I thank you, Lord God, that the, that the wind of Holy Spirit is causing there to be a rustling and a, and, and, and a whirlwind, hallelujah, on the inside and everything, Lord God, that has been holding on for dear life that is not of you, that it will be ripped up in the name of Jesus from the root, hallelujah. I thank you, O oh God. Father, I thank you, O oh God, that there is a there is an intricate searching even now, even now while we are on this line, that there is an intricate searching. The hidden places, oh, the hidden places of the heart where we have packed away things that we have that we have idolized that we have pumped into our veins that we have consumed repeatedly over the years that has calcified in the heart oh my god that has calcified in the heart and now we have arrived at a point where there is truly a desperate need for, Lord God, a stripping, a stripping, a stripping, and a chipping away so that the blood of Jesus, that the blood of Jesus can flow through us as intended. Hallelujah. Father, this calcification that I'm seeing, oh God, the build up in the veins and the arteries, oh God, all of these religious things, oh God, that we have held on fast to, Lord God. Father, deal with it. Go in with the precision of Holy Spirit and begin to remove it in the name of Jesus. Cause there to be, Lord God, a, 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 ooh, a, a, a straightening, a straightening say, of every crooked place, Lord God. And I even hear this, people who are on this line who are afraid, there is a fear that is resonating even now, that if I was to let go of all of what I've understood over time in terms of these externals, that I won't have anything left. And the word of the Lord to you is that you have the standard left. And that is what God is wanting. He wants you to let it go. He wants you to let it go. Some of you on this line, you are members of churches and I don't say that, I don't take what I'm about to say lightly. I am very, this is a very calculated statement I'm getting ready to make. You are part of churches and organizations even right now that you know you are supposed to sever. Not out of hatred, not out of anger, not out of, 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 of any, anything other than God has already been dealing with your heart to make the exit. Because you have reached capacity in that place. And now you have stepped into religion. You have stepped into ritual, rituals and routines. And you have capped out in growth because you will not move. The Lord says, you already know. It's time for you to leave. 
And some of you who have already left, you're still, there's still a level of fear because you feel like you're lost. You feel like you don't have any type of stabilization. You feel like you don't know which way to go. And the Lord says, rest. Because all you need is me, rest. I have already given you the accountability you need. You think accountability has to be in the construct of a church, in the construct of a particular ministry, but you have the accountability you need by way of something very untraditional, something very non-conventional, unconventional. I see the Lord bringing people there. They're already staged for you. But you have to, you have to release yourself. What's coming to me right now is that a lot of times we think that something has trapped us and is holding us, but the reality is we are holding it. We are holding on to it with a death grip. And the Lord says, loosen your grip. As a matter of fact, take your hands off of it in the name of Jesus. Take your hands off of it because you have, you are in a place, my God, mm -mm 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 -mm. you are in a place where God is saying now, now is the time when I am going to unveil where your trust really is. Where is your trust? Because if you trust me, like you say you have all of this time, I have, in, I have allowed the perfect conditions so that you can demonstrate your trust in me. Do what I say do. Not because I'm barking orders or I'm a slave master and I'm cracking the whip. No, obey the command because you love me and I love you because we're in relationship. And I know that if you obey me, that when you make the exit, when you do what I tell you to do, you're going to enter into the place of wealth. The Bible told us. Now, and I'm not just talking about money. You will enter into a wide place of understanding of who he is, the wonders of his person. Oh, my God. Can we relinquish everything? If everything had to go right now, would we, we, would we be able, hallelujah, hallelujah, would we be able to move forward? That is the question. That is the question. Would you, would I be able to move forward with only the standard, nothing else? Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. When Jesus told Peter to come, Peter was good as long as he was singularly focused on Christ. His life was still happening. Things were going on to the right. Things were going on to the left. But he was not touched when he was able to focus on Christ, when his aim and his goal and his aspiration was Christ. Everything lined up, everything lined up. But at the point in which he began to look at everything else what religion tells us to do, what our, our own selfish, fleshly, sensual appetite tells us to do, go get another job because the finances ain't right. Go and, 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 and get in covenant with people that you know. You know they don't have a heart, but you think on the outward that they had the resources. So if I connect with them, they can help me. The Lord says, no, what you need is in Jesus Christ and every instruction that is a derivative of Christ is out of love and is because God knows what is necessary for you, for me, for us to move forward so that the world can know who he is not what he can do for us.
Hallelujah, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. This cry, this well, this is about really trying to convey that the Lord's heart is relationship. It's relationship. Everything you are looking for, it is in relationship. That need for validation, that need for acceptance, that need to feel love, that need to be wanted. The Lord says, all of it you will find in me. If you keep looking externally and trying and trying to earn and doing and working, you will miss the very thing you're trying to get. And it's in me, the Lord says. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord. I didn't mean to go into all of that, but God did. And so I'm, I'm done. We're not even going to get into this call to action because I believe that we are. The discussion is going to lead us into other things that God needs us to know. But um, I'm done. We can stop the recording. Hallelujah, Lord. <laughs>